I've been involved in uh, creating, designing, building, using, destroying, trashing, losing UAVs, drones. Uh, it's been fun, and now I wanted to also bring that experience in hot. And as I see many other companies, organizations that are trying to do uh, collections for humanitarian mapping, I want to be part of it and share my experience and, and try to coordinate a little bit so that we get good data to put into open air map. So, um, a small and man aerial system or a small and man aircraft system or kites or balloons or nano satellites are all like small things that we put up in the air with a camera. Uh, my first UAV was just a remote control airplane with uh, Canon uh, Ixus, the first Ixus with duct tape. Uh, and that was the, the first collection that I did. Uh, but yeah, you, you have people putting out uh, uh, cameras on balloons. Uh, the public lab, it's a great example. They're doing uh, even balloon mapping kits that you can buy and uh, go out and map. Um, and then we have these small satellites. And all of these systems, they are creating a revolution in how imagery, how aerial imaging is, is done and it's democratized. So these are all like small and man aerial systems. But uh, when I was doing uh, uh, my research at San Diego State, we also built not so small aerial systems. So we put a full the spectral sensor in there and uh, we flew that until uh, actually someone stole that from <laughs> the department. <laughs> it was inside a trailer and the trailer disappeared. So. But yeah, it was fun uh, and uh, just to say that uh, there's definitely things involved with putting things in the air and, and the bigger they are, the, 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 the worse they they can do if they things get out of control. So, is it legal to fly drones? Well, in the U.S., sometimes it is. Some people say it is. If you're a hobbyist, you can fly your drones trying to avoid airports and uh, other uh, man-piloted uh, airplanes. But uh, there's also legislation coming out. So. The FAA is promising rules for uh, allowing people to use UAVs for commercial use, for professional use. And so at the moment there's actually what they call an exemption for people to research and practice and use UAVs for commercial uh, activities. And so um, it's starting to be more and more legal to do it. Uh, in other countries we've seen, all, I mean we see all kind of uh, legislation. Uh, in some countries, there's no legislation that even got there, and so it's still like the wild west of, uh, of UAVs. So depending where you are, it's always important to, to know what you have to do before you put your UAV drone in the air. There's also a website, actually, for, for the US. So um, you probably all have seen drones on your, on your Amazon, you, you probably put them on your Amazon wish list, or you, you see them in the stores, mini drones, but what can you actually do, or what do you actually need for making that drone able to map? And so, uh, there are two main types of uh, UAVs or drones that you can use <coughs> for mapping, and, and they're basically these two, like a multi-rotor UAV or a fixed wing UAV. The main difference is the multi-rotor, it's easier to, to use, or people say that the wing is also easier to use, but in general it's easier to use, but it has a limited range and so you can only map a certain um, amount of area with that, about 15 minutes to 30 minutes time, 30 acres, 50 acres, but it's easy to land, it's uh, a little bit cheaper than the, 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 the wing platform. The wing platform they stay aloft or they, they because of their uh, aerodynamics, they stay in the air much easier, they can fly longer, and so with that system you can cover much more air at the same, uh, uh, the same time. And they're also more expensive. That is uh, a popular system built by a 
European companies and supply and it's called the EP. So important thing for mapping is what you put inside this EOD. So anything from small cameras, uh, from uh, um, even like commercial off the shelf cameras like the uh, Canon, or multi-spectral camera, which also became much smaller since I I put my multi, I mean, our multi spectra camera into the uh, big UAV. So that's actually like the size of the other uh, Canon camera, but it's a full multi spectra camera. So you can collect near infrared imagery to do analysis and, uh, analysis and vegetation and, and water, other things that are not captured in the, in the visible uh, spectrum. And then even hyperspectral cameras, they get in much smaller and more. <coughs> smaller and smaller and you can do more analysis that people with remote sensing background uh, are used with traditional larger sensors. So another uh, thing that makes the, this system easy, I mean uh, good for mapping and going to place and map is how uh, easy they are to be uh, transferred to that site. So to map with UAVs you have to get pretty close to the site that you want to map because you have a limited range, but that means that you can bring the sensor of the system with you and wherever you go, you can just put up a UAV and start mapping. You don't have to wait for the satellite to come back in the same place. You don't have to go to an airport to start uh, your flight for going somewhere to map with a full aircraft. So that's another uh, key advantage of uh, mapping with UAVs. And the process for doing your mapping and doing good mapping is doing good flight planning. Flight planning means that you need to tell the UAV how to fly, where to fly, how high, and depending on the sensor that you have on board, then you basically tell it how much overlap between the different photos you, you need. And so depending on the overlap, you make sure that the map is complete and there's no holes in between your, your flight paths, right? So if you want to map a, an area like this, you have multiple flight lines in parallel to each other to make it cover the area. Once you uh, put up the UAV, the UAV uh, normally runs in automatic mode. That means that it's been instructed to follow a certain path, the one that we defined before. And so it follows these lines and automatically snaps pictures every uh, one second or by GPS points and that is what, uh, the, where those pictures are taken. In this case it was, uh, it, they didn't really do a very good job of making a good flight plan, it was probably just some uh, uh, four points that they, they put as reference, but basically those pictures are taken up in the air and through the software that we use for processing you can see where that picture actually uh, sits when and, and the sensor and the, and the software system. Yeah. What is that software? That was uh, uh, Agisoft, which is a uh, software that costs around $3,500. Yeah. And uh, it's based on structure from motion uh, um, approach of putting together images. But actually, I'm, uh, yeah, uh, basically, the idea behind the processing of UAV imagery is to find key features in each image to match with other features in the other images. And then put them in all together and create this bundle, what they call it, for creating the actual mosaic. But you need to find those features, so the same exact corner of the building or the, or the, of the tree, in one or more images, or at least three images that have to share the same pixel. And the software does it all for you. So this software runs on laptops these days, and automatically detects all these features and it creates this bundle. Basically, those are all the, the frames that you saw from, uh, from before. Uh, and here's uh, um, easier to see where you see all those uh, um, orange points. Those are features that, they, that the software finds in all those scenes and automatically puts them together and it creates that mosaic. And those on the right, for example, these are all the links between the images that are found. And here you can see how those images kind of build up the mosaic that I was mentioning before. So uh, there's several commercial packages that you can use, and those are have been developed for almost 
four years now since we started using drones for mapping. And they range between $3,000 to $6,000, $7,000. And you can map like anything from 100 uh, images to thousands of images. So there's also an open source option, which uh, we really like and we really support, and it's called Open Drone Map. And the idea is similar to the ones that the same processing uh, chain that you see in the commercial software, but it's using all open source uh, pieces, open source software to do the same process. These are some examples of what you can get out of the processing. And in addition to the images, you can actually get terrain. You can use uh, uh, principles of uh, photogrammetry for interpolating uh, two images or three images together and extract the altitude of each point that uh, uh, intersect with all those images. And so the output is actually a terrain model, which you then can use for those of you uh, familiar with uh, GIS and uh, remote sensing to or to rectify the actual mosaic. So it's very accurate compared to some of the other imagery, satellite imagery that uses like a coarser terrain model for to rectify the imagery. So. But um, out of the software, you get a point, cloud, a point cloud, which then you use for doing the terrain. And this is another interesting thing because you can visualize in 3D all those points, uh, colorize them based on the RGB values, and, and provide a like a virtual image of what the actual uh, site looks like. In this case, two uh, bridges on, uh, in Arizona, one of the sites that we flew. Uh, as I mentioned before, you can do uh, color infrared imagery, and since these uh, uh, small UAVs can sometimes host more than two cameras, you can put a standard RGB camera and, a, and another modified NIR near infrared camera together, and the software puts it all together. And so you basically merge two uh, sets of uh, bands to create, a, for example, in this case, a color infrared set of uh, images which can be used for mapping vegetation, water, and all kinds of things that we don't normally see in the visible spectrum. Um, I just wanted to mention that some of the imagery that we collect is not so nice and so easy to put together and it doesn't provide that mapping that we uh, normally do with professional mapping UAVs, but it still provides a lot of uh, useful information. In this case, from balloon mapping you can't really do mapping in perfect lines, straight lines, so when you put the camera and the balloon is up in the air, you try to control it to bring it to where you want it, but it's, it doesn't always follow a path or a coverage that, that you would like. So this is an example of what a mosaic would look like when you do balloon mapping versus like a, a standard like square uh, coverage that you have with UAVs. And this is an example that I, um, that I just found that I just saw recently uh, used an open stream map. Uh, one of our members in Colombia wanted to do uh, an update to a slum in, in Isla de Leon, I think. And they had done a mapping party a few weeks ago, but now they wanted to update it with a visual from the air. And so um, they collected all these images with, uh, with a small quadricopter. And then they, they posted it somewhere, and someone else from France actually offered to process them. And so they put together a nice mosaic that then they were able to basically use for updating into OpenStreetMap. And because they did a nice job of flying it, of processing it, of finding the type points with existing data, existing imagery, then that imagery is, it becomes useful right away into OpenStreetMap because it matches what it, uh, it's found there and it can be used to update what you have in, the, in that map. Uh, another example of uh, using UAVs for, um, for humanitarian mapping happened in the past months when uh, Cyclone Pam hit Vanuatu and a delegation or a group of uh, UAV mappers uh, funded by the World Bank, I think, uh, flew out to the islands and started uh, collecting images all over the different islands in, uh, in Vanuatu. And so this is an, uh, an example of the flights that they did on uh, Ifati, on the main island, and this is what it looks like. So 
this is something that you don't always get from uh, Sala imagery. This is a level of details that goes down to one centimeter or, or more sometimes. And it really gives you a, a, a good view, even if it's restricted to maybe just a little village, it really gives you a, a, an overview, a, a good visual of what happened. And so at that point, we realized that we could really start doing some damage assessment because we could see much more than we would normally see with satellites. But then, um, sorry, this was just a, an example of showing that at the beginning the images were not uh, registered correctly and so there was the shift with existing uh, data that we uh, recorded on OpenStreetMap. But then by doing some adjustments, we were able to match it to existing imagery and then start building off of the same database and do the, the damage assessment. And so, um, just going back to the um, idea of doing damage assessment with PI, with humanitarian mappers, uh, we normally don't do it. I mean, uh, we still don't do it. Right now we're debating what to do with the new imagery that we get from Nepal, for Nepal. We don't really have a, a, a schema that we've been agreeing on. Since 2010, there's been several different models that have been used from Haiti to uh, uh, other uh, events, but we don't have something that has been fixed and that can be posted and say, okay, use this model, use these tags for tagging images. And one of the, of the reasons also is because we can always really see what's in the, what is the damage. We can't really use the solid images to, to, to do a good job of doing that damage assessment. Now with UAV imagery and maybe oblique or point clouds in this case, I think we're in much more, in much better position to start doing that and be more confident about, about our uh, interpretation of the, of the images. And uh, this is an example from uh, Patrick, who coordinates uh, a group uh, called UAV Acres, which is basically a standby task force of uh, companies, people that have, that have UAVs and they're ready to deploy to these areas and collect images. And then they take the images, they put them into a, a map, and in this case, they show oblique imagery, and they're able to see a different view again of the, of that same area and tag it in this case through their uh, model for doing damage assessment and post it online. So uh, we are starting to try to agree on a, on, you know, on, a, uh, on a data model, on a workflow for doing this together. And uh, this is their website. In this case, uh, they actually already deployed uh, uh, many teams to uh, Nepal. Uh, they've been out since, I think, the day after, because some were already there, but they're sending people from Canada, from the United States. They are there now, and uh, we are waiting for um, the imagery to, to come back and start looking at it. Um, to close some of the considerations and challenges for the future and for mapping with uh, UAVs, there's definitely some legal and safety issues. That, uh, and I think if you go on UAV aiders, that is the first big red note up on the on the website, especially for Nepal in this case. That anybody that is flying UAVs, especially in this uh, congested uh, disaster area they have to coordinate with all the agencies on site because it could raise serious uh, problems. But the same, you know, here uh, uh, in the US, anywhere in there, in your different countries, there's legalities, there's uh, rules to follow. And some of these rules actually have been developed to integrate sensors for UAVs to see, to actually being able to replicate what a human would be doing on a manned aircraft. So being able to detect maybe through radar what's around them and being able to avoid it if the other vehicle cannot avoid them. Right? And then there's a need for uh, coordination between different teams, training, making sure that people that do it have the certification or they, they know that they, uh, they can produce good quality data. Uh, there's definitely issues we've seen like uh, uh, people trying to go to Ukraine or areas 
uh, that are um, subject to, to conflict. And so uh, the same apply to ethical and privacy issues where uh, we need to, to be careful and this is a more general uh, discussion about drones and, and, uh, and how they affect our, our privacy and being able to see down to the details of the centimeter what we are doing, basically. But, um, and then uh, in terms of, of mapping, there's definitely some things to consider in terms of what sensors we can put, what range we can achieve with, the, with those platform, and how good is the data that we receive, and um, how good are, uh, how standard are the data models that we use for interpreting the imagery. Because we can, you know, have a Rome standard for damage assessment. Uh, Copernicus or Unosan may have a different data model. When we put them together, we basically don't have the same set of rules for understanding, for defining damage, and so it just wasted uh, efforts in, in this case. So standards and data model something for uh, for the future. Um, and again, to uh, really understand why UAVs are important and will be in the future of, uh, of humanitarian mapping, of mapping in general. Like we've seen in Nepal, like lots of clouds, we can't see anything through satellites, so we need to be under the, the clouds. Regular aircraft, they can't even take off right now or, or land, or the airport is so congested that they can't uh, even let standard uh, passenger flights land or um, crew flight plan. So UAVs being able to just take off from anywhere are really going to be uh, important in these situations. Again, like <coughs> it's a way of democratizing aerial imaging. It's a way to empower communities. We've seen it in uh, Colombia. And definitely it's a way to achieve a resolution that we've never seen before. And most of all, as we've seen with many of these groups, it's easy, relatively easy, and it's fun. And so I invite you to learn more, discover, and ask me any questions, and have fun with UAVs for mapping. Thank you. Do you have any questions, but I think we're... Yeah. Um, how much is there an ability to change either the elevation or like lens angles, and do a trade-off between the resolution and the range you end up photographing? Um, you mean... Um, in flight, like uh, what you can put on the. Are you always launching at like the same elevation relatively, or like the same altitude that it flies at? Oh no, no. Actually, depending on the sensor, like the lens, for example, the focal length, you are able to fly much higher and achieve the same uh, resolution that you would do at a lower level. And if you fly higher with a longer focal length, then you have less distorted images and so that also is a consideration for mapping where you want to try to have good nadir images flying higher and with a longer focal length. Of course you get a smaller footprint if it's a longer focal length, but the higher you go then it, the bigger you actually capture. So. Yeah. The, the flight planning software, is the image processing, are they on the same platform or is it two different software? They are two different software. I haven't seen something like all in one, but there's plenty of open source uh, flight planning software. Even on your Android phone, you can uh, create a flight plan on your Android on your phone and just send it to the to the plane to the UAV and do it. But then for processing, you definitely need a, at least a laptop. So it's a separate package, basically. Is it is it a manual takeoff and land process or a whole thing? You just kind of like get the flight plan and then step away. And well, some that I've seen, I uh, haven't um, used them yet. But really, you put them on the table, or even they sit on a station that it it actually charges them. Like when you leave them there, and you can be into another office and just click on the computer and say, okay, take off and go map this area. And land back on the same platform. Yeah, and then start recharging, downloading data through the same platform. Oh, wow. Yeah. But from uh, my experience, I've been launching it by hand. We've been taking off from runaways. We've been crashing them. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? Most of the planes are controlled, right? Sorry. Some of them, yeah. Others are pretty big. Fixed wings. Most of them you have to manually launch them. Yeah, or they have catapults. 
that, or even like slingshots. And yeah, you learned it that way. Just a curiosity, I always see those pictures of people like trying in the countryside, but like how about in a city? Because I, I imagine that accidents happen and you crash them and they fall on the ground. And what about? Yeah, what about like? Uh, are, are there groups doing this yeah, like yeah. in the city? Yeah, most of the legislation in the US and the rules are, are being defined is uh, normally to avoid urban areas fly over houses. Uh, I see it happen all the time, but by experience I'm not flying over houses or roads anymore because uh, yeah, they can just fall and, and crash. Or, so it's a real concern and that's why we, we need good, uh, good rules or good solid platform, good systems, good computers that we can trust to put them up there. Yes? Is it a good, well accepted format for if you want to put out a path and say, hey, we really want the imagery over here, yeah. can we write that to some API or to some standard that a lot of these tools? <coughs> well, that maybe extends to the next workshop where we're going to do, uh, where we're going to talk about imagery coordination, <coughs> but the idea is the same. We uh, don't really have a platform at this point for processing UAV imagery, it's more like software that automatically, like if you do flight planning, you can input shape files or KML or read a service with a specified um, polygon. But uh, at this point, there's not really a service where you can push your AOI and say, go map this. The software does it, like the flight planner, but there's not a standard yet that I know. Anyone else? Otherwise, we'll go into the uh, discussion about image coordination. Coordination. I think that's the title. All right. Thank you, guys.